includes memes, guns, politics, and culture war commentary. Prepping, Fallout New Vegas, Peg Leg Chicks, the voice acting industry, conspiracy theories, and an old man's angry rants. I'm your host, the Melancholy Walrus, so sit back, shut up, hold on, make sure mommy and daddy sign those field trip permit slips, because I'm about to take you to Boomer Town. And we're back. Boomer Town Podcast Episode 2. I suppose this is uh, something I gotta keep doing now, consistently, uh, since Episode 1 was so well received last week. I mean, uh, over 1,400 views on SoundCloud for a brand new account is uh, is not that bad for a podcast coming out of left field, out of nowhere. Um, over 500 new followers on the Boomertown Podcast Instagram account. You know, that's uh, that's not too bad, actually. So, yeah, uh, let's, let's keep doing this uh, for the time being. There's a lot to talk about this week. Um, this is probably, this episode's going to, come at you guys probably like a day later than you were expecting, probably a day later than I had promised. Uh, you know, whatever, it is what it is. I don't know if I want to make this a consistent, like, every Wednesday or every Thursday type thing. It's, you know, because sometimes things happen. Like, I was going to I was gonna upload this last night. I had, um, actually, the reason I'm saying this is because I had actually recorded episode two already and decided to scrap it because there's been a lot going on in the last 24 to 36 hours that I wanted to make sure that I got to talk about in episode two. Uh, one of those things is Yang Gang. Yang Gang? Who's down with Yang Gang? Damn, this is coming out of nowhere, but uh, it's really gaining some traction. Andrew Yang, 2020, for president. We'll get into that later. The other thing is um, Nick Fuentes and his um, his incredible live stream last night from the campus of Iowa State University in uh, Ames, Iowa, wherever the hell that is. Um, but yeah, it was awesome. Um, so shout out to Nick for that. Um, anyways, there's some other things we're going to talk about. And uh, so let's just get right into it. First order of business uh, I could talk about, I suppose, is uh, hosts. So the Dwayne Clark was supposed to co-host episode two. And he was uh, always, you know, it was always kind of planned out that he was going to be the first uh, guest host of Boomer Town. And uh, he was going to be in town uh, here in Vegas um, this uh, earlier this week. He Over the weekend, he said he was coming to Vegas. He was going to be here, blah, 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 whatever. Um, he was interested in doing the show and coming on here. And, you know, we were going to shoot the shit. We were going to talk about some old stories and um, about, you know, us and our group of friends from high school, you know, we did some really crazy stuff that, um, I've touched on, on Instagram, um, on occasions. And a lot of you have, I've heard a lot of feedback. A lot of you would like to know more about those stories. And, um, you know, I'm only one guy. Um, my memory is limited when it comes to that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> but, um, Dwayne, he's like a, he's like a living biological archive, um, so yeah, that was the, the reason why I wanted to have him on here. Anyways, to make a long story short, Dwayne was lying about coming to Vegas. Why? I have no idea. It's Dwayne. It's the Dwayne Clark. He just, he does that kind of shit. Um, lied about coming down to Vegas, lied about coming on the show. And, uh, the problem is the problem. See, that normally wouldn't be a problem with anybody else, any normal type of person, uh, cause they could just call in and we could figure out how to do it on Skype or whatever. You know, I have, I've never done that. It would be a learning experience for me as well. The problem is, is while I have full confidence in myself to be able to adapt to situations like that and, uh, and, you know, make it work, Dwayne, uh, Dwayne is Dwayne. And if you, if you're listening to this and you have no idea who Dwayne is, then this isn't going to make a lot of sense to you. But, uh, my followers from, Instagram, uh, especially the longtime followers, they know exactly what I'm talking about. There's, there's just, there's no way in hell that Dwayne would be able to figure out how to call in, uh, on Skype. And the reason why we would need Skype is because my understanding is when you do podcasts or whatever, there's, you can't just do like a phone call from a regular phone and patch that into an audio recording, um, or whatever you have to, you know, you'd be like uh, Skype and then you 
do the, the phone call with the interview and all that. And then afterwards in post-production, you, you do, or I guess while you're making the phone call, you do a screen record and then you take that audio file, import it into Pro Tools, you know, or GarageBand or whatever you're using um, as an audio file and uh, as part of the podcast. Anyways, it's really complicated. Uh, well, it's actually, it's not that complicated for a normal person, but then again, Dwayne is not a normal person. So um, anyway, so no host, sorry. I know it kind of sucks, but you know, I have no problem doing this on my own. This is my own project and uh, we're just getting started and um, you know, there's going to be uh, bumps in the road and new ideas are constantly flowing and coming in. And this is an ongoing um, evolution of a project. So yeah, no Dwayne, sorry. Hopefully we'll, when, next time he comes down in Vegas, we'll, I'll try to have him on here. And, uh, yeah, but it's, it's not easy to tame the Dwayne, the Dwayne Clark, follow him on Instagram. Uh, if you're not already, it's big D wild two, four, seven, um, big D D is in Dwayne. I'm sure if you would ask him what the big D stands for, he would say something other than Dwayne, but that's just Dwayne moving right along. Um, hopefully I'm going to have Gusnav from Instagram, um, the founder and creator of the T-Posing meme. Uh, I'm going to have him on as uh, guest host, co-host for episode three next week. So stay tuned for that. should be pretty epic. As far as other stuff I wanted to talk about tonight, um, man, did you guys hear about this, uh, this, uh, this group of high school kids in Newport Beach, California, or uh, Huntington Beach, or an, in that area of uh, Orange County, Southern California, um, man, it's like the latest Covington uh, Catholic high school type uh, just craziness in the media. And, and what I mean by that is so so ap- apparently there was there was a bunch of kids, and they were at a party last week, uh, last weekend, I believe. Uh, they were at a, a high school party, house party, and they were playing beer pong. And uh, they they were they, they had the cups uh, they had the cups set up on either side of the ping pong table. One in in now I haven't I, I don't have the the picture to pull up, but uh, from what I understand, it's uh, it, it was a swastika on on one side of the uh, ping pong table uh, made out of the red you know solo cups. And on the other side of the ping pong table was a star of David. <laughs> so, yeah, it was World War II, beer pong, uh, national socialists versus the Jews. So, you know, it was guys and girls were playing. Um, there were Jews, Jewish students, high school students present, and they were playing. They had no problem with this. Uh, this is all, I mean... Obviously, they didn't have a problem with it. This is all, it's all fun and games. There's a bunch of drunk uh, high school students having fun. Now, I don't condone underage drinking. You know, just don't, don't do that. But if you do end up doing that um, and you do something stupid like uh, under, or <laughs> underage, like uh, uh, World War II beer pong, it's it's crazy because you put that stuff on social media like any fun loving high school normal kid would do because it's it's funny it's funny it's politically incorrect it's humorous that is what comedy is based on and always has been uh regardless of what MSNBC or you know some social justice warrior on Twitter might tell you as they attempt to redefine comedy for all of us irresponsible human beings you know they have to teach us how to act like as if they're as if they're on some kind of uh you know pedestal or high horse or some position of of uh of uh moral high ground or something and it was just retarded anyways you put that stuff on social media and with outrage culture and call out culture of course you're going to have people freaking out about this, absolutely freaking out, losing their mind, saying this is anti-Semitic, this is bigotry, this is racism, this is intolerable. 
and you start getting people like that on social media, it starts getting retweeted, shared, or whatever by hundreds, thousands of people. Everybody's sharing it with their friends like this is some kind of mass murderer or something, some kind of serial killer on the loose, you know. You, it, it just The amount of attention these things get these days is just incredible to me. So it starts getting shared by all these people, and um, naturally it's going to get picked up by who? Who, who kids? Who, who is it? Who we're going to talk about? That's right. Journalists. Journalists who are looking for uh, their big break. Journalists who uh, have nothing better to do and no morals. Uh, there's no journalistic integrity or morality other than let me try to get a leg up in my field. So they pick up on this shit, they see these stories, and they take it and they think it's news when it's really not news. It's only news because they're making it news. They're going to make it into a news story, blow it out of proportion, all right, so that thousands, millions of people on social media and elsewhere are going to pick up on this. And and they're seeing these journalists um, talk about this. So it, these people are so brainwashed uh, they're going to be like, oh my God, this is this is a huge story because this this journalist, you know, ABC Channel Seven local SoCal news or whatever is talking about it, and they have their blue check mark, which completely validates, uh, you know, these these normies' perspective that oh, this must be a this must be important, this must be an important news story because a Twitter verified journalist is talking about it and freaking out about it. So yeah, let me just uh, you know perk my ears up and give it give it a listen here and share in the outrage because this is preposterous. Oh my goodness, 17, 18, 16 year old kids playing Nazi Jew bing bing pong <laughs> ping pong. I can't even I can't even keep a straight face as I try to talk about this because this is so ridiculous. It's so inflammatory. Not not what they did, but the aftermath of it. What these journalists are doing what these SJW types, and it's not to say that all journalists are SJWs, but journalists definitely know how to play and manipulate the feelings of uh, the SJW, social justice warrior people who are professionals uh, as far as outrage and call out culture goes. They're, they're, they manipulate them, get their attention because they know that they're going to blow the story out of proportion, which is going to elevate, you know, the viewers. Um, and the likes and retweets and views of this, you know, so-and-so journalist's um, Twitter account and everything, and he might get a promotion, uh, you know, at ABC7 SoCal, uh, KLXR or whatever. Anyway, it's, it's, it's ridiculous if, if, you, if you can't see through the bias, if you're one of those norm— well, I'm not even going to go that route because if you're listening to this podcast— the chances are you are nothing close to that type of person. So anyways, um, so yeah, um, let me open up my Instagram account here because I posted about this um, three or four days ago. Uh, yeah, okay, so here it is. There's, uh, yeah, there's the picture of the kids. Um, they're having fun. They all got their phones out. There's guys and girls. You look like between the ages of 16 and 18, 16 and 19. Um and uh, they're standing next to the ping pong table. There's a swastika. And uh, this person, whoever posted this, her name is Ava. It's Ava Rose, at it's Ava Rose underscore. She says, scrolling through Snapchat, and I see this from a Newport High School party. Absolutely disgusting. <laughs> and that's where it all started. And that tweet went viral. So here's some people um, that have quote tweeted it. Um... Let's see. Yeah, here's the journalist, uh, Greg Lee of ABC7 News in Southern California. Receiving a lot of messages of outrage over this photo posted to Snapchat last night. Being told this was a party with high school students from Costa Mesa and Newport Beach. Working on this story. Waiting to hear from the district and schools these kids may attend. ABC7, Orange County. Greg, what, what the fuck are you doing, man? This isn't, it's like I, I tweeted back at him and I said, working on this story? What story? This isn't news, you idiot. 
it's only news because you're making it news. This is kids having fun. This is not a a local, let alone a national, global news story. Like, are you kidding me? Here's a pretty good take uh, from a guy, practical nationalist that I follow on Twitter. He quotes the same tweet that Nazi cup ping pong picture, and he says, these people, referring to the journalists, these people know that the people in the picture are not genuine Nazis, but rather want to shock people with humor. And they still try to dox them and ruin their lives. Demons. You know, he's right. These people are absolute demons, these journalists. Um, you know, I, not, I'm sure, you know, there's some good journalists. I know a few, I know, rather I know of a few, but God, these people, they're so despicable. They're so despicable that there's there's no loyalty, there's no common sense left in journalism uh, for the most part. They're just looking to get ahead in their field, and they're willing to throw people under the, under the bus, even if it's, you know, 15, 16, 17-year-old kids uh, having fun at a party. You know, this, this has nothing to do with Nazism. This is kids having fun. This is kids being edgy. It, it's a joke. You have you had Jews there. You had Jews at the party playing this game. <laughs> Yet you're you're upset as a journalist or or concerned as a journalist that the Jewish kids weren't upset enough and so you're going to get vicariously upset for them and and blow this out of proportion into a huge Oh man. I I hope you can tell how upset I am, how angry. This fucking pisses me off. This kind of shit. It's so ridiculous. And I've seen it get worse and worse and worse um, as I grew up in my into adulthood. Um, I mean, this kind of thing, this wasn't around. This kind of journalism did not exist when I was a kid. I grew up in the 90s. This this was not... Oh, I think I just dated myself. Anyways, maybe I'll have to edit that out later. Anyways, uh, <laughs> this, this kind of shit did not exist before social media. This is a direct result of social media. Yeah, you had tabloids and, you know, weekly world news and that kind of bullshit, but but this kind of shit didn't make it to those national publications um, like it does now. It does in just a matter of hours, uh, thanks to social media and um, outrage culture. So getting back to the original Snapchat story that somebody uploaded, um, the uh, <laughs> I'm looking at the picture with the, the swastika and all the kids laughing at it and smiling and taking pictures with it and everything there the 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 caption the snapchat caption underneath the swastika says german engineering and it's funny there's a bunch of bud light uh cans of bud light on the ping pong table and and uh it just you know looks like a good good group of kids good as in normal this is just normal teenage kids southern california type kids you know having fun i i I know the type. Uh, I spent almost every single summer of my childhood and my adolescence in Newport Beach. My parents, uh, my family has a, um, they had a condo there uh, on the peninsula, Newport Peninsula. And uh, I spent three months of every year down there and it was great. Got to know a lot of people, um, still friends with a lot of them, um, especially from the Villa Park, uh, Costa Mesa and Santa Ana areas. Um but yeah, this this is just a normal group of kids. This is nothing to get your panties in a twist over. I know I keep reiterating that, but this this story just pisses me off that much. So um, let's see. There's uh, let's see one of the kids who was at the party. His name is Jack Burbo or Burbo. I don't know, B O U R B E A U. Um, he. <laughs> He posted the or reposted the picture on his Instagram story, and uh, the caption says, "Although I'm not in the picture, I must confess that I was here, and I feel terrible for the repercussions that this has caused. I was not involved in the game, and beg anyone who sees this not to spread negativity on me or my friends. I am very sorry for my actions, as I am guilty by association. I hope this will show people who are." Let's see. Oh, yeah. I guess this will show pe I hope this will show people who are bagging on my friends that the group of people that attended this last night are good people. So that was his slide with the Nazi swastika. Slide over one more time and the next post on his 
Instagram story is LMAOJKXD. Last night was awesome. I have no sympathy. Uh, sorry, he says, I have absolutely no sympathy for anyone offended by this. This is the same kid. This is Jack Burbo. Okay. I have no sympathy for anyone uh, who was offended by this. I'm a Jew and was there with some of my closest friends, and we played a sick ass game of Rage Cage. All the motherfuckers trying to censor this shit are Nazis, if anything. Quit trying to gather up soft boy points and piss off pussies. Jack. <laughs> Jack Burbo, the MVP. So there you have it. Um, it's a Jewish kid. Jewish kid was there. He was playing. Nothing wrong with it. You know, guys, get get the fuck over yourselves. All right? These journalists, they can go to hell. Um Fuck all of them. Fuck everybody trying to blow this story out of proportion. Fuck everybody trying to ruin these kids' lives. You got you got people, you got the outrage culture SJW types on social media trying to call the school. Well, not trying. It's already happened since this was posted four days ago. Calling the school district, trying to get these kids expelled. Um, uh, blasting their names and the addresses of their parents and where they live and homes and everything on the internet. Um, blowing this entire thing out of proportion, making sure that, uh, cause a lot of these kids were seniors and they're probably already applying to college. If not, they're going to be doing so really soon. Um, it may, trying to make it hard as possible, if not impossible for these kids to go to any kind of decent college, regardless of their grades. Can you imagine, can you imagine like working your ass off all through high school and, you know, getting that 4.0 average or whatever. And and you go to this party and you're just having fun. And, you know, let's say, like, you, you weren't even really involved in it or whatever. Let, let's say you were on the Jewish side. Yeah, let's say, let's say you were on the Jewish side of the ping pong table, all right? But you're playing with these uh, these kids on the other side, with on the swastika side. You're now guilty by association. You were at the party. You Your life is now ruined. You're not going to be able to get into Stanford. Uh, because some dumbass piece of shit journalist, Greg, ABC7, Southern California, Orange County, uh, wants to blow this up into a big deal and make sure that Stanford knows that uh, that you were there and, and you're a Nazi and you're an anti-Semite and whatever kind of phobe, phobic, what, I don't know, it's all bullshit these days. But yeah, it's, it's so ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. Uh, this is the kind of shit that should get the average person's blood heated because, um, you know, they try to fuck with kids, they try to ruin lives, and it's all, they're throwing people under the bus, and it's all for their own personal gain in their own career field. So, yeah, that's why I will never shed a tear uh, when uh, BuzzFeed or whoever else, you know, has to slash 15 20% of their... Um, of their reporters and their journalists or whatever, uh, for budget cuts or whatever. You think I'm going to feel bad about that? No, fuck you. You know, go learn to code motherfucker. So yeah, shout out to Jack Burbo and his, uh, his buddies and homies at, um, Newport beach high school, Harbor high, Costa Mesa high, whoever was involved. Um, you guys keep your, keep your chin up. Don't let these bastards grind you down. And, uh, you know, good for you for, <laughs> good for you for not caving. This is, this is going to turn out to be just like the Covington Catholic high school thing where, you know, people are blowing it out of proportion and there's going to be lawsuits, um, hopefully eventually filed against some of these, uh, some of these people online who blew it out of proportion and that ought to get them to shut the hell up. And, uh, yeah, let's see. What else do we got? Oh, speaking of journalists, um, did any of you guys catch Tim Pool on the Joe Rogan show? Let's see, I don't think it was yesterday. It must have been the day before yesterday. Um, he was with Jack Dorsey and this other lady who's like, or Jack, Jack, sorry, Jack Dorsey is like the head of Twitter. Um, he's the CEO or COO. I think he's the COO of Twitter, the chief operating officer. And he was there with um, with a lady. I can't remember her name. Uh, it sounded like Vijay Jay. So we're just going to call her Vijay Jay. 
Uh, so Vijay Jay is the head of Twitter's safety department. It's Twitter's safety department. So she was there. Vijay Jay was talking about the process and the criteria for getting banned and why all these people have been banned permanently and whatnot. Tim Pool is an independent investigative journalist. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what organizations he's affiliated with. But um, I remember what the first time I saw Tim was back in 20. Oh, man, was it 2015, I think, uh, or 20 early 2016, whenever the big uh, the big Baltimore riots were. I think that's where I saw him uh, live streaming from or no. You know what it was? It was uh, it was some kind of like Black Lives Matter riot in Wisconsin. Must have been 2016. I'm almost positive. Anyway, that's irrelevant. So Tim Pool, Tim Pool, he goes by Tim Cast on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, probably everywhere else. Um, he is just calling out Jack Dorsey and this Vajayj chick um, for their hypocritical, biased um, decisions to permanently ban uh, conservative uh, conservative people, conservative pundits um, on Twitter for their views, basically, and for things that they've said. And, you know, shit like that, Um, while at the same time allowing people who engage in the same type of behavior, um, but who happen to be left wing, you know, Democrats, liberals, people like um, Antifa types, um, black block, whatever, (laughs) these retards, you know, uh, they're allowed to stay on Twitter and engage in the exact same well it's not even the exact same they, they they engage in far worse behavior let's put it that way than these conservative people who have been banned um, people like uh, Milo Yiannopoulos people like Alex Jones uh, people like Baked Alaska um, just all, many 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 different types of different right-wing people oh Gavin McInnes uh, and anybody associated with the Proud Boys you know they just got like blanket banned you know, in the last year or two, uh, more so in the last year, it's, it's getting out of hand, which is why, uh, Joe Rogan has had Jack and other Twitter, um, Twitter, what do you call them? Twitter people, <laughs> uh, on his show to address this problem. So anyways, Tim did a really, really good job in confronting Jack and JJ, um, you know, asking them the real, uh, in-depth questions, uh, and he, this guy did his homework and he's, he is a, you know, he's a solid, solid guy, a good journalist. He came prepared. Um, he had his bullet points. He had his talking points. He had counter arguments already prepared. Um, and he's, you know, so between Joe Rogan was there trying to mediate the whole thing, but, uh, in essence, he was just giving a platform to Tim, uh, in order to kind of confront Jack about this, this, uh, this uh, Twitter banning bullshit. And I can't stress enough, just Tim did a really good job. If you guys have a chance, go back and watch that episode of uh, the Joe Rogan experience because it was pretty incredible talking about, you know, free speech and um, Twitter is basically, it's a privately owned public space. I mean, that is, that's where, that's that's the the, the modern iteration of, of uh, of the town square, yes, it is privately owned, but you have term their terms of service. Uh, well, let me let me step, take a step back. One of the good points that Tim made was, um, yeah, Twitter's privately owned, but you guys, as in Twitter, you guys are affecting and influencing elections, presidential elections, the midterm elections. They're influencing elections by having this massive platform that everybody uses, journalists, normies, uh, politicians, even the president of the United States uses it. Um, and they happen to have terms of service that that are, uh, they, they, they don't correlate, they don't align with actual um, uh, Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court decisions uh, regarding free speech. To put it bluntly, Hate speech is free speech. Hate speech is protected speech. You you're you're not allowed to uh, prosecute somebody for uh, hate speech. You know there's certain exceptions or whatever, 
But um, for the most part, the Supreme Court has ruled that hate speech is protected speech. So you have this private company, Twitter, who has terms of service and what they deem to be hate speech, they will permanently ban you and kick you off of their platform and you no longer have a voice in the in you know in in life in this this major platform that influences elections. So it it's not really it's not like, you know, uh, walking into a Starbucks and uh, trying to make a speech about you're trying to say the N word or whatever, and Starbucks manager kicks you out to say, "Oh, that's my free speech." Or whatever. It's it's not like that. This is it's so much bigger than that. It's it's on a much grander scale, and uh, you know that that little Starbucks coffee shop is not influencing, or you know the people in there, the dialogue, the discourse that that occurs in there is not influencing you know a presidential election, whereas uh, the dialogue and discourse on Twitter. Uh, because everybody's there and everybody's using it, uh, does. So that's the difference. And one of the great things that came out of Tim and, uh, or, you know, Tim's, um, the arguments that he was making with um, with Jack Dorsey and Vijay is that, um, I, mean, for, I mean, I heard it with my own ears. Um, Twitter, the, the people who run Twitter, verbally agreed that there ought to be and they claimed that they're working on creating this, but anyways, that there ought to be a pathway of uh, rehabilitation and redemption for people who have been permanently banned on Twitter in the past. That is huge. That's a huge deal. Um, I, I hope you guys understand how big that is, and that's that's how it should be. Well, first of all, they should have never been permanently banned in the first place, um, but... Uh, Jack was saying, you know, Twitter is is constantly uh, evolving and it's so big and, you know, they never anticipated it being this big and they're dealing with issues and problems uh, that that they couldn't have ever anticipated before. And so it's an ongoing process to further refine uh, Twitter and the terms of service and how they deal with these kind of things um, you know, now that they're they've become so influential. So it's actually a really huge step on Twitter's part to even say that they're willing to create a pathway back onto the platform. So, you know, it we'll, we'll see if they actually do that or if they're just, um, you know, if they're just talking out of their ass, hopefully they do. And hopefully they do it soon. Um, I don't think it would take, I mean, I'm not a programmer and I certainly don't, you know, understand Twitter their algorithm and their inner workings of all that, but it doesn't seem like it would be uh, a very, a huge, difficult, big thing to to create this uh, pathway for getting back on the platform. So we'll see. In the meantime, um, keep speaking out. I'm going to keep speaking out for free speech, and um, you know I'm totally against this uh, deplatforming culture that has um, that has risen up and come out of nowhere in the last year. Uh, more so in the last six months, uh, where the left is just totally, totally throwing free speech under the bus, and uh, you know they, when when they can't argue with people on the right, conservatives who have good arguments. So when you can't argue with that person, you know you're just gonna try to do everything you can to shut them down, deplatform them, um, get them off the air, get them off the internet, get them off Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, everything, because you cannot you're just going to have, you're just coping at this point because you can't argue with them. So, um, yeah, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the toddler or the little kid who gets so angry that he's losing the game that he just picks up his toys, you know, and walks away. No, if I don't get to win then nobody gets to play, that's the American left. And speaking of the American left, Oh man, did, did any of you guys, I hope you saw Nick Fuentes, uh, his live stream on Twitter, Periscope, whatever it was last night at Iowa State University. Um, just, <laughs> it was amazing. So Nick Fuentes, um, I think he was affiliated with Turning Point USA. It, to, he was you know, supposed to go to Iowa State University and make a speech, deliver this speech in front of a conservative crowd. And um, a crowd of students. And I'm not exactly sure 
how or why this happened, but my understanding is that the people who put this together for him, I, I think they're campus conservatives uh, affiliated with Turning Point USA, I believe. Um, anyways, Nick travels from Chicago. I think that's where he lives. Um, he comes from Chicago to Iowa. He gets there. And the conservatives who have supposedly set this up for him and reserved the room that he was going to speak in and everything, they they kind of they kind of like bailed on him. It was they were like no shows. I I think. I mean that that's the that's the that's the impression that I got. So he shows up there. The room that he's supposed to speak in is not available. There's little to no campus conservative supporters there waiting for him. And he just drove or flew, I don't know, probably drove hundreds of miles to be at this thing. And, and it's just like, hmm, <laughs> what do I do now? Um, so Nick being the fiery, extremely bright, charismatic young guy that he is, uh, he decides to turn the situation around to his benefit, to his advantage. And he just goes outside well, let me back it up for a second. The room that he was supposed to be in, um, that was supposed to be filled with conservative Republican <laughs> college students uh, to listen to his speech, instead of that, it was filled with uh, counter protesters. I saw like two pictures, and it was mostly black people, and uh, a couple of them were wearing Black Lives Matter shirts, and it was just like the the stereotypical angry, overweight, black, college student, women type, just loud, you know, like (laughs) they were like waiting for him there. Uh, And Nick just had this huge grin on his face the whole time because he knew exactly what had happened, you know, for one reason or another. Uh, You know, these people, uh, his supporters, you know, it's quote unquote supporters bailed out on him and threw him under the bus. So, yeah. So instead of canceling the speech, uh, which he, you know, very well could have done, and 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 ninety nine percent of people who follow and like Nick, they would have been, yeah, okay, yeah, you know, that sucks. Uh, I don't really blame him for, uh, for kind of throwing in the towel and and turning around and going back home. No, <laughs> Nick Fuentes, the absolute madman, uh, decides to just go outside of the call or the campus. He's still, well, he's still on campus, but outside of the building, outside of the hall that he was supposed to speak in, and and just delivers this speech uh, that was written for a conservative Republican crowd. He delivers it to all of these Black Lives Matter <laughs> protesters. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it was beautiful. It was beautiful, and it it uh, it it was just like you imagined it would be. Uh, given those circumstances, it was actually better. Um, <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Uh, so all these, I mean, you can imagine how loud it was, unruly, rude, uh, just, just fucking, just loud. People are so loud. They got, they're so loud, they have absolutely nothing to say. Nothing intelligible to say. They're just loud, and they want to be heard, and it's ridiculous, and they make no, a little to no good, solid, valid points or counter arguments. Um, so yeah, Nick, Nick stands up on this, on this little wall and starts delivering his speech about, you know, which was, uh, <laughs> I don't even remember most of it. Cause I was, I was in, I was in awe at how idiotic the people attending there were behaving. Um, and frankly, I was just in the comments typing a bunch of, you know, ridiculous, outrageous bullshit, uh, making fun of everybody there. But yeah, I do remember that um, I, the speech was mostly written about um, uh, immigration and how and how unchecked mass migration to our country and to any country really, um, it's going to affect uh, it's going to affect the country negatively. It's going to affect everybody in the long run negatively, um, the working class. And uh, he starts talking about how, unchecked mass migration from Mexico is, is actually hurting. Uh, it's hurting the black community. It's hurting the black, uh, the black working class. 
and uh, he's he's talking about black people and and why you know why they shouldn't just be latched onto the Democrats the Democrat Party tit you know just suckling you know and feeding off of whatever the Democrats tell them to to believe and think and vote or whatever and uh, he's saying look the, this immigration policy including the immigration policy that President Donald Trump just spoke about and supported at CPAC is affecting us negatively and it's affecting you. It's affecting black people. How are you supporting this? Why are you supporting this when, you know, um, min- it's, it's going to affect minimum minimum wage uh, working black people uh, the most out of anybody? And, and there was this Black Lives Matter girl saying, hey, yo, uh, hey, why are you saying black? Yo, I find that really offensive. Yo, you keep saying black. You talk about black people. You know, you white. You can't. You can't talk about. You know, I just find that offensive. Why you keep saying black? It's African American. And Nick, oh man, I'll never forget this. Nick like turns to her, and looks at her, and it's like this big fat black chick, and uh, and she's wearing a Black Lives Matter shirt. <laughs> and he's like. What do you mean? What do you mean? It's not. I can't say black. Aren't you Black Lives Matter? And the whole crowd just erupts into just like unintelligible screaming and yelling and angry. Uh, just you could just imagine. You know, I, I honestly at that point, from that point on, and he spoke for probably like another twenty minutes. Um, but that was the pinnacle of it. From that point on, I legitimately was fearing for Nick Fuentes' life. I thought he was going to get, <laughs> I thought he was going to get lynched. Um, and he had his camera guy there. I don't know who it was, but you know, props to that dude. Cause that dude kept his cool. He kept his mouth shut, uh, instead of engaging with the protesters. And he just sat there and filmed it for Nick. Um, but uh, oh my God, yeah, it was it it was great. I I, I seriously thought Nick was gonna get his ass beat. I thought he was gonna get jumped, and uh, I wasn't the only one. There was like over a thousand people watching the live stream, and everybody was like, "Oh my God, Nick, get out of there, get out of there!" And somebody <laughs> somebody said, "Nick, quick, throw them a basketball to distract them." <laughs> it, it got it got that bad. Um, so it just. Um, yeah, all sensibility was lost. Uh, people were shouting, and uh, they started chanting something about white supremacy or whatever, which is you know, which is ridiculous. You know, you got it's Nick Fuentes. He's he's half Mexican or whatever, half Latino. I mean, it, come on. So, uh, but Nick made some really good points. Uh, he did a, a excellent job delivering his speech, regardless of the circumstances. Uh, the unfortunate circumstances that presented themselves, and uh, and he got the message out, and a lot of these Black Lives Matter people who were there, and it wasn't just Black Lives Matter. There there was uh, there was some white people there, some white ki- uh, college kids, um, and they were like, uh, you know, your typical soy boy communist Marxist types or whatever, and they were trying to yell and scream at him too, but. The point that I'm trying to make is that Nick didn't back down at no point during his entire live stream, which um, it, 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 it was there was two parts of the live stream. And together, I think it was close to like an hour long because uh, he did some Q&A after he delivered the speech. But at no point did he show fear. At no point was he um, apologetic uh, for you know using the word black people. Uh, in front of Black Lives Matter people, you know, participants, members, whatever. Um, unapologetic. Uh, he was very articulate. He was very professional. And he was not afraid. If 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 you don't take away anything else from his message, without getting into the semantics of what his speech was actually about, you can at least learn a lesson in public speaking, and not just public speaking, but just in being a strong, uh, a decent human being in this crazy day and age, this crazy clown world that we live in. And, uh, you know, never apologize for being white. Never. You have nothing to apologize for. You know, stand up for what you believe in. 
um, stand up for what is good, regardless of whether what is good is politically correct or not. Political correctness is not moral. It's not moral. Morality and political correctness are not the same thing. And one of the greatest tragedies of the last 30 years in America, well, all over the world, but mostly in America, well, in Europe too, Europe's already fallen for the most part, but uh, one of the greatest tragedies in the, of the last 30 years in America is, is how the left um, has, has replaced, well, they've undermined religion in our country, in our society, undermined religion. And by doing that, they have destroyed uh, morality because, uh, you know, for thousands of years, um, religion was the vehicle by which morality, good morals, was passed on, you know, from from one generation to the next. They were tied together. And what the left has done uh, in order to undermine society as a way to gain control politically and gain power, it's all about power, is they've undermined religion and... Uh, by doing that, they have undermined morality. And at the same time, while they were doing this, uh, in order to not create you know, a vacuum, because when if you take away morality from people or if you make morality laughable and something of a mockery, you, you have to replace it with something. Otherwise, you get this, this, um, this psychological, you know, um, sociological vacuum. So what they replaced it with is political correctness. And political correctness, PC culture, um, that it's it's not it's not the same as morality. But God forbid you actually say that to somebody who leans left, they're going to think that you're a Nazi and that you're a bigot and that you're the most horrible person on earth. Because well, how could how could political correctness not be moral? It's it's correct. It's political correctness. But you have to understand it's not the same thing. So. Um, Anyways, I, I, I go off on these tangents. I'm not going to apologize for it because it, you know, it's good content. And, uh, but yeah, shout out to Nick, man. What a, you guys really need to be following this guy. He is the voice of young conservatives. He's only like 20 years old, 21, maybe I think. Um, but yeah, conservative, young, Catholic, uh, religious. He's not just Catholic. He's actually religious and, and, um, you know, has a good head on his shoulders and you should be really, uh, watching out for this guy and listening to what he has to say. Uh, big mover and shaker in the conservative movement. He was kicked out of CPAC last week. Um, definitely ostracized by the mainstream conservative Republican movement in the United States. And if that doesn't tell you who the real enemy is, then uh, then nothing will. So it's not just the libs, you know, we got to watch out for. It's the, it's the neocon conservative it's the republican party as it is as it stands right now the republican party is uh, just as much uh, of an obstacle to making america great as the left-wing progressive democrats are so and and you know, this is nothing new it may be new for you but this is nothing new for me ask anybody you know who's known me for more than 20 years or whatever i i've always felt um, and I'm not unique in this at all. That's not what I'm saying. But I've always felt ever since, you know, I reached, you know, my late teens that the two political party system in America is just it's compromised. It's compromised. There, there's there. There aren't two parties. It's actually just it's one party. The, the, it's like a pyramid. You know, you can start you can start off, uh, you know, climbing up the, the pyramid of Giza. Uh, you got one guy on one side of it, another guy on the complete opposite side of the pyramid, you know, they got ropes and you know, they're repelling or whatever, but you climb up, they're both climbing up to the top. They're eventually going to get to the top of the pyramid and meet. It doesn't matter how far away at the very bottom they are at the very top, they're going to meet up. And that's how I see American politics. It is not the Republicans and the Democrats who are in charge here. You know, there are, um, Entities, organizations, deep state, whatever you want to call it. We can get into that in future episodes. Those are the ones who run the show. And they run the show. They run both sides of the show, both parties. 
So you, you got to get that through your head. I'm, that's why I'm not, I'm not a Republican, you know, I'm not a Democrat either, but, um, I, I lean conservative. I'm right wing. I'm an independent conservative. And, um, I, you know, nobody, unfortunately, nobody in current politics, American politics seems to be on the same frequency as, as, as I am. Um, if there are, there's very few and I don't, contrary to what you might believe, uh, from what I post on Instagram or even what I say on here, I don't follow politics a lot. I don't, I, it's, 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 uh, (laughs) it's, it's, uh, it's tiresome. It's also tiresome and we're in clown world and I'm not completely black pilled, you know, where I'm just a, a nihilist and, you know, nothing matters anymore. I am not quite there yet. I'm not quite there yet. But, uh, but that's the path, you know, that's the route. That's the, uh, that's the road I'm on. And, uh, and I'm kind of comfortable here for the time being. And wow, would you look at that? Look at the time, as they say, right? Um, I've completely blown past the 45 minute length of this podcast, uh, cause I wasn't watching the time. Um, I really don't want to have to go back and edit out any of this content because, uh, you know, maybe I'm maybe I'm just kind of a narcissist like that, but I think it's all decent, good content, and I should keep it on here. So, uh, but, but at the same time, uh, I want to talk about Yang Gang. I want to talk about Andrew Yang and that phenomenon that's, that's going on, that's quickly gaining momentum on social media and how he's replacing... Uh, Trump as my option for 2020. Um, <laughs> now, don't don't freak out. I'll explain why and what the uh, psychology behind all of it is and everything. But yeah. Um, anyways, I'm gonna keep talking and not edit any of this out, and I'm just gonna have to upload. Um, you know, because sound or the hosting site that I use limits each episode to 45 minutes. So I'm just going to um, upload two episodes for tonight's podcast. Uh, one's only going to be like 10, 15 minutes long. So let's get right into Yang Gang. Yang Gang 2020. Andrew Yang for president. Andrew Yang is a Democrat. Uh, he's running as a Democrat. He's an entrepreneur from Schenectady, New York. He is an Asian American. He's the son of um, Taiwanese immigrants, I believe. And, uh, as far as his backstory goes, that's really all I know because I don't care. It doesn't matter. Yang gang 2020 is, is not about, uh, I mean, there's people on Twitter and social media and Reddit and 4chan or whatever. They'll say otherwise, but it's not really about Andrew Yang's, uh, policies. Uh, this is, this is, (laughs) This is a temper tantrum. Make no mistake about it. I'm not belittling Yang Gang at all. But this is a temper tantrum for all the people, myself included, who helped um, Trump get elected in 2016. This is all of the quote-unquote meme war veterans um, who were heavily involved in online pro-Trump propaganda in 2015 and 2016. Um lashing out because Trump is a wall. Where, where are you at, bro? Where, where are you, Trump? You have gone completely off the rails. It, it, we're talking like no campaign promises fulfilled. Um, it's gotten worse and worse and worse since the government shutdown, where it's just become apparent that Trump... Now, I have my theories on this, on why, but I don't, I'm not sure if I want to get into them, at least not in this episode. Um, but he, he's completely sided with the establishment, neocon, Republican, GOP, good old boys, you know? Um, and he's just, he's just kissing their ass. He's, uh, well, let let me put it this way. Um, let me get on my Twitter account here. So let's see. So I posted a, uh, I posted a Yang Gang meme last night. Um, the meme was basically this, there's three pictures. One is, uh, one is Andrew Yang, just his normal, um, 
his normal picture that that he's using uh, for his campaign. The other one is that same picture, but with like the gang weed Joker face painted onto him. You know, with the green hair and black eyes, black around the eyes, and white face and and red uh, lipstick. And then the last one is, uh, it's like some kind of like, I mean, I'm not familiar with like Asian cultures and how to differentiate, but I don't know if this is like a Japanese shogun or samurai or some kind of like Chinese emperor, old, old school, ancient emperor style drawing or whatever. But anyways, that's what it is. That's the body. And he's wearing like all the ancient dynasty Chinese dynasty style clothing and then it's it's Andrew Yang's face on it and the caption is broke we live in a world woke we live in a society bespoke we live in a motherfucking dynasty Yang Gang 1000 year Yang dynasty and uh, one of my followers on Twitter responded and said memeing the US into socialism and I responded and I said no accelerating the inevitable thanks to Trump And then he says, huh, what did Trump do now? And I quote tweeted it, and this is what I said. And this is this is why I bring it up, because this is the best explanation so far of what's going on with Yang Gang. Um, I said nothing, absolutely nothing. Not one single campaign promise has been kept. It's totally controlled by the Jewish lobby and the neocon Republican establishment. We might as well get paid $1,000 a month to sit back and watch some ching-chong Democrat from Schenectady burn America to the ground. Yang gang. All right, there you have it. That's what it's all about. This is um, Trump supporters who are understandably upset and livid that Trump is not fulfilling his promises. Um, He's kind of left us in the dark. He, he, He was always kind of just taking us for granted, um thinking that we were just going to automatically support him in the 2020 re-election campaign while he's off dicking around with APAC and uh, the Republicans and the GOP at CPAC talking about, you know, unbridled uh, mass migration. Oh, yeah, as long as they come here legally, we need more and more and more. We need all the immigrants in the world. You know, we're going to bring in more than ever before. Are you kidding me? Are you? That's not what we need. We need. How's that going to make America great again? It's not. It's not. So, without getting into specific issues, you know, I'm not going to pick apart Trump because this is mostly just a meme. It, now, I don't speak for the, for everybody in Yang Gang because there are people who, in the last 48 hours, have completely sided with Andrew Yang, and they're all for it now. Now. I'm 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 with it. I'm I'm in it, but kind of ironically, here's what I hope happens. I'm going to support Andrew Yang, even though he's a Democrat. Um, I'm going to help meme him into the primary election. Well, hopefully the general election. I want Andrew Yang to beat out Bernie and Kamala Harris and whoever else is running for on the Democratic ticket. I want him to beat them out. Um, And what I hope this does is I hope this sends a message to Trump and the Trump campaign that we are not happy with what he's doing and we are willing to throw our support to someone else. Hopefully that shocks him into realizing, oh, God, I'm, I'm actually ignoring my base and the people who, you know, help get me elected. Maybe I should get my head out of my ass. Um, And, uh, you know. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, <clears throat> Andrew Yang, <laughs> Andrew Yang believes in what's called a UBI, which is universal basic income. He wants to pay every adult American one thousand dollars per month, regardless of whether you're employed or whatever. Everybody gets a thousand dollars a month. Now that's, I mean, <laughs> that's laughable. Yes, I'm. I, I get it. Like that is laughable. But at this point, to quote Hillary Clinton in the Benghazi uh, congressional hearings, what difference does it make? We're in clown world, okay? We thought Trump was our last hope. We thought Trump was going to save everything. He's not doing that. He's not doing that. In fact, he's doing the opposite. He's uh, he's in with the, the establishment. The swamp has taken over. Um, 
it, if you want to know my opinion, it's Jared Kushner. God, I wish, I wish, I wish Trump would fire him. <laughs> Uh, without saying uh, other things that might get me in trouble. I wish Trump would fire him. I wish he was out of the White House. Um, but yeah, um, so hopefully uh, this whole thing, you know, gets enough momentum with the memes and everything that Andrew Yang starts actually making some serious traction in the Democratic primaries. And he's going to make Kamala Harris and Bernie Sanders and whoever else is running, he's going to give them a run for their money. All right, because we're going to throw our support behind this guy with the hopes that that by him winning or at least looking like he's going to win, it's going to shock the Trump campaign into taking action and realizing, oh, man, we've totally, you know, ignored our base. We need to get back to our roots, um, change our policies and whatever. And in the meantime, it makes for great memes that there's an Asian dude uh, who wants to pay me a thousand dollars a month. If he wins the presidency, like, I don't give a fuck if he's Democrat or not, you know, like this is, this is the stuff memes are made of. Uh, this is perfect. So, uh, yeah, we're going to be a little politically incorrect, um, to his benefit in the long run. Right. Uh, it's all going to be fun and games and everything. I I'm in it ironically for the time being that might change down the road. I don't know. You know, I have no problem saying that, but I'm in it, um, ironically for the time being. And it's funny as hell, man. Some of these memes on Twitter, oh my God, just fucking hilarious. Like, uh, this guy, <laughs> I, I hope this guy's eating it up. Andrew Yang. Uh, he's, he's, I, I highly doubt he was counting on anything like this happening, um, you know, a month ago or whatever, but it is happening and, uh, you should jump on it. Yang gang. Um, let's get paid a thousand dollars to sit back and watch the world burn if it's going to burn anyway. So in closing, yeah, Yang Gang is about the memes. It's about having fun. It's about showing Trump and the Republican Party that we independent conservatives, um, we're not happy with the way things are going in Trump's first term. And we're not just going to sit back and, and allow them to take us for granted and expect us to just vote vote him uh, into a second term if he's if he's got his head up his ass and he's not doing what he promised he would do um you know make him work for it make him work for our vote there's no reason if if nothing else i hope this just breaks the black and white thinking that um you know the identity politics that is so prevalent in our society in this country that you must vote one way or you must vote the other. You must do this because you are white or you're, you're black. You must do that. If you're Hispanic, so you must vote, you know, Democrat or whatever. No, it's all, it's all bullshit. Wake up. It's all the same party. It's all the same thing. So let's fuck around and make them, as in Trump and his campaign, um, make them work for our loyalty and not just expect it uh, for nothing, right? And with that, I'll say good night. Uh, tune in next week, uh, probably like Thursday, maybe Friday. I'm not sure. It depends. I'm gonna try to get Gusnov on here, as I said before, and uh, we'll talk about some other current events and big things that are happening. Uh, I'm sure a lot's gonna happen between now and next week, um, politically even, uh, especially with Yang Gang in full effect. And uh, yeah, so thanks for listening. Good night.